Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Emesis Blue, published on YouTube in 2023. Emesis Blue is a feature-length fan film animated entirely in Valve's Source Filmmaker. The Source engine has powered a litany of huge hits, including Half-Life 2 and the Left 4 Dead series. Although personally, I experienced it more through Counter-Strike Source and especially Day of Defeat Source. Man, I love Day of Defeat. Emesis Blue's writer-director Chad Payne didn't base his film on those other, more grounded games, though. He used assets from Team Fortress 2, a cartoony and stylish 2007 release that chronicled the endless war of Red vs. Blue. No, sorry, not that Red vs. Blue. This machinima uses the Red vs. Blue that has all the hats. So, so many hats. TF2 is a multiplayer first-person shooter. There's no single-player mode or campaign to speak of, just endless match after match online. But that doesn't mean Payne had nothing to work off of. The game has a very specific aesthetic, not quite mid-century modern, but definitely 60s spy genre inspired. Like like early James Bond films. The jazzy soundtrack and propagandistic posters all over add to that flavoring. Also, and I didn't know this, but Team Fortress 2 did have lore that was gradually established through game updates and comic books. As the story goes, in the late 1800s, munitions magnate Zephaniah Mann had two feuding little asshole twin sons. He gifted each of them an equally useless plot of land. Blue Tark Man took Gravel Pit, making it blue controlled, naturally, while Redman Man took Dust Bowl, putting that map under control of the Red Team. Ever since then, the brothers have been hurling nine-man teams of mercenaries into death matches to steal the other's waste of space. Over the years, Valve fleshed out the personalities of its nine character classes with a series of videos that were directed and edited using the publicly available Source Filmmaker tool. Anyway, that's how I lost my medical license. <laughs> Archimedes! No! For his feature-length Source debut, Payne took that same software and the broadest strokes of the game's lore, but left out its sense of humor to create something much more disturbing. I was intrigued when I heard about Emesis Blue, because Team Fortress 2 is, no joke, probably top three games in terms of hours of my life I've spent playing. I used to take my laptop to lectures in college and play it in the back of the auditorium. Don't do that, it was fucking dumb. Payload was my favorite, I mostly main soldier, but also medic like a mofo with friends. I absolutely I absolutely love TF2, both for its gameplay and its sense of humor. The way the characters act and sound in the game is hilarious, and I watched those Meet the Blank videos as they came out. I was delighted to learn they still hold up now, a dozen years later. They're well made and legitimately funny, just like the game itself. Emesis Blue follows two storylines, one of a medic looking for his missing patient, the other of a spy and his soldier assistant searching for a kidnapped governor. Their storylines intersect and get tangled at a slaughterhouse of horrors, which houses a respawn machine created to provide the Warring Man Brothers with their infinite troops. The respawn machine is central to the whole film, which explores the side effects of that technology and what happens when it starts to malfunction. If you've watched Emesis Blue and still didn't know that was the story, don't worry! The movie is a bit on the opaque side, avoiding flat-out explanations and instead reveling in its nightmarish tone. Between the time jumps and time loops, it's easy to get lost. And even after watching this several times, there are still certain things I don't understand. But that doesn't really bother me, because this thing is nothing short of a technical masterpiece. Every shot makes it obvious why it took Chad Payne five years to finish the film after releasing the first trailer. It's creatively directed, which is doubly impressive given how it was made. Payne clearly has a cinematic eye and a sense for suspense. Yeah, I was lost sometimes, but I can't understate how impressed I was by this thing. In a film about infinite troops fighting in an endless war... Endless I'm war? I know exactly how that feels. <laughs> 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 Damn it, Soren, this is gonna mess with my KD. But at least I get to enjoy my respawn routine with today's sponsor, Dr. Squatch. I love Dr. Squatch for their great quality soap bars. They smell great, feel fantastic, and they're environmentally friendly thanks to compact cardboard packaging. Plus, for the first time ever, they're including three free soaps in their buy three, get three bundle. It gives me so many options to choose from, like this bay rum bar. With a blend of cinnamon, cloves, and orange, I might as well be sailing the Grand Line. Although on second thought, I think I might go for this pine tar bar instead. Its pine extract smells oh so good, and its heavy grit will help me exfoliate my newly respawned body. Ah uh, yes. Kill counter smooth. Now to just place this on the soap saver to extend the bar's life. Perfect. With this awesome buy three, get three free deal, I saved $28 on everything you see here. Now then, to get back to Kill Count. And then the doctor discovers that the weeping angel- oh! I don't want to go. Too bad. Oh. Sorry about that. Ah, oh, man, he changed the set deck. Uh, Fiona, could you please fix this during the transition? On it. 
Thank you. All right, where was I? And new customers can get the buy three, get three soaps free deal for themselves by going to drsquatch.com slash dead meat or clicking the link below. That's like buying six bars for only $4 each, which is hard to find for such a great quality soap. In a film about infinite troops fighting in an endless war, there have got to be a lot of kills to count. So let's get to them. The movie begins with nightmarish test footage of a respawn machine. Feels like something out of the back rooms. It leaves this day of defeat soldier with his eyes hurting. They shouldn't be hurting though. They're not even there. Idiot. On Halloween night, 1968, Dr. Fritz Ludwig, aka the medic, reveals he has the same nightmares I do. Lots of dead bodies to count. From what I can tell, there are six red bodies being dumped into this, sir, uh, sewer tunnel. The medic's also a Kubrick fan by the looks of it, and might have latent fears of evil gonzos and or tickle monsters. But don't worry, doc, that shadow's just a Scout. The scout, real name Jeremy, tells his doctor friend that he's been having nightmares about being followed. The medic knows a solution here. Mmm, Valium. In the game, the medic is just as liberal with his medicine, playing a support role who heals the other classes with his medigun. The character is a self-taught medicine man who ignores the do-no-harm part of his job in favor of scientific discoveries. In the game, he's voiced by Robin Atkin Downs, who also voiced Shinnok in the animated Mortal Kombat movies. In Emesis Blue, the medic's voiced by filmmaker Chad Payne, who also voices the spy, the demo man, the heavy, and a whole bunch of other characters. Holy crap, dude. I like that he takes the effort to imitate all their voices. The sound of progress my friend. Oh, don't be ridiculous. This friendly checkup is interrupted when a box of VHS tapes tips over on its own. Jeez. You got a whole video store in there. An anachronistic store at that. VHS tapes weren't invented until 1976, eight years after this movie takes place. The scout's insurance doesn't cover rentals, so he steals the 1931 film M by Fritz Lang, a film school classic. Should have grabbed the battleship Potemkin while he was at it. After this opening, the movie takes an episodic format, starting with chapter one, Graveyard Shift. Across town, a veteran soldier is so bored, he almost blows away a harmless shadow person. He's waiting for his boss, a private investigator spy, to meet with the their latest informant. They're looking for information about the recently kidnapped Jules Archibald, the governor of New Mexico who's backed by the Blue, the Builders League United Company. Their informant is a heavy, a Russian character, and the American soldier doesn't trust him one bit. That Rusky's twice your size. That makes sense, given the whole, you know, Cold War thing. Don't forget, this movie and the game take place in the 60s. In the game, the heavy is an enormous jovial man named Misha. He likes to sing the baritone songs of his people and eat a steady diet of sandwiches. That keeps him Big strong! So he can carry around Sasha, his 330 pound Gatling style minigun. Meanwhile, Game Soldier is a crazed American patriot who was rejected by every branch of the US military for being too crazy. He went on a one man World War II campaign that didn't end until four years after the war was over. His voice is very much styled after George C. Scott's depiction of General Patton. We're going to cut out their living guts and use them to grease the treads of our tanks. And from that day forward, any time a bunch of animals are together in one place, it's called a zoo. In the game, he was voice acted by the late Rick May, who sadly died of COVID in 2020. But I do think Jazzy Joey Jr. does a good job emulating that style here. Also, I know the soldier's name is Jane Doe, but I'ma just call him Soldier. The heavy informant doesn't show up empty handed. What's on the briefcase? Dude, you can't ask that. It's the briefcase. In the game, the intelligence briefcase acts as the flag and capture the flag mode. You've got to protect that thing or else you risk disappointing the announcer lady. And you don't ask what's in it. It's, it's just important, okay? It's your classic MacGuffin. The heavy answers the spy's inquiries by beating the shit out of him. Thankfully for the spy, the soldier saves the day with some classic Cold War hatred. Hey, Stalingrad. Eat this! And also a big gun. Before the two blues can check out the briefcase, that strange plague doctor swipes it, then leaves in a stolen hearse. In chapter two, dinner's ready. The medic drives his patient home and reluctantly admits that there have been some problems with the blue company's respawn machine. Uh, it doesn't always work like it's supposed to. Some get stuck inside trying to come through. The scout's dropped off and buzzes into his mom's, uh, alley house? What, what's going on here? Whatever, as long as it's got a TV so he can watch the tape he took. Great use of the real movie's audio as this scene's sound design, with a lot of static, a ball bouncing like the one scout tosses around, and a kid speaking German. Before you can say foreshadowing, Jeremy hears a voice say something much scarier on the phone. Hello? Thanks for the ride, Doc. It's a creepy recording of the conversation he just had with the medic. When the other him hangs up, Scout looks to his mom for guidance. Huh, why is she peering around the corner like that? What the 
fuck was that? A terrifying kill is what it was. Looks like Scout's mom was decapitated, possibly by a shadow figure or uh, Asuka? No one's ready for that. The game version of the Scout also loves his mom, which leaves him vulnerable at times. Wait, wait. He's the youngest Merc, a cocky, loudmouth baseballer from South Boston, who, for some reason, has a Bronx accent. Um, I, I don't even know where to start with you. I mean, do you even know who you're talking to? Basically, kind of a big deal. The Scout can walk, talk, and capture control points faster than the other classes, with his speed and double jump ability balancing out how weak he is. The Medic wakes up from a little steering wheel nap and decides to return to the Scout's mom's home. There he finds a Sesame Street crime scene with an M for mail there, and also alluding to the movie on the TV. The situation gives the doc the vapors and a minor concussion. Somehow he comes to in his office with blood on his hands. Hmm, maybe that M at the Scout's house stood for Medic. He's definitely having some kind of breakdown, but at least it gives us Evil Dead 2 gags, that's fun. Oh, wait, nope, never mind, that's another concussion. An envelope slides under his door with a key in it, which might be useful at the Conagher Slaughterhouse. That's probably where the scout is now, whose muffled screams the medic hears over the phone. <laughs> Chapter 3, wait, Intel Hell? Oh, Intel Hell, okay. Picks up with the spy and soldier at the crime scene pretending to be federal agents. One of the first responders says the perp left in an ambulance, pointing the dynamic duo to Dr. Fritz Ludwig. And if that wasn't evidence enough, I'd say this bone saw is plenty. The Hardy Blues head to the medic's office where they make a ghastly discovery. It's his latest victim. It's a model, you idiot. A model bastard. Still, there are other things suggesting the good doctor ain't so good, including another looped phone call with the medic's voice that really confuses the soldier. Who is this? It's the voice of God, you son of a bitch, and I'm coming for you! Ludwig couldn't have been calling, because he and his medigun just got to the slaughterhouse. Good thing he arrived before the entrance fell apart. The Conagher slaughterhouse is played by the red portion of the classic Capture the Flag Map 2 fort. And I mean classic, man, because the TF2 version is a remake of a map from Team Fortress Classic, the original game that I am old enough to have played many a time at LAN parties. Oh my god, is that really what the character models look like? I feel ancient! The medic tries to take the first elevator he finds, but it's unfortunately occupied. Incredible weight limit on that thing, though. The undead Russian chases him deeper inside the slaughterhouse and even breaks his precious health hose. It's pretty sad to see this, since in the game, the medic and heavy are besties. Nothing like an uber-charged heavy wreaking havoc. Ludwig follows the ominous M's until he finds Scout's baseball and engineer's wrench in a chained-up coffin. Using the key slipped under his door, he unlocks it to find Jeremy taking a little naps for Ati. Weird how ungrateful he is, though. If I had a gun, I'd shoot you, you sick bastard! Okay, you're welcome. The scout runs from the healer directly into the bullets of a gun turret. It was set up by two engineer brothers, Slaughterhouse founders Zed and Maynard Conagher. He looked lost, boy. Don't like how that boy sounded coming out of him. Zed's the dominant brother here. You can tell by his communication style and how he gets first dibs on drill torture. Within Team Fortress 2 lore, the Conagher family made infinite warfare possible. To feud beyond the bounds of their natural lives, twins Blue Tark and Redmond Man both independently enlisted Radigan Conagher to invent a life extender machine. Radigan's grandson, Del Conagher, is the game's engineer character, a soft-spoken Texan who plays support by building teleporters and supply dispensers. Oh, and sentry guns. He loves his guns. The answer. It's a gun. The game character's soft-spokenness comes off as relaxed. His older bros and Emesis Blue, conversely, are menacing as fuck. Maynard is left behind babysitting the briefcase, but he quickly gets bored and plays the piano. It might be Blackbird by the Beatles? The, the chords sound similar to me. I really enjoy this part, especially with the funny little sound gag. <laughs> as the medic chokes the engineer with a phone cord. Too bad Maynard reverses the charges, and the two have to square off like the start of a Mortal Kombat fight. The medic's no match for Maynard. He beats him down, then breaks out the double barrel to blast a hole in his chest? What? Luckily, this ain't no ordinary medic. He's extra absorbent, and also somehow alive again. That's brawny strong. Ludwig embraces his second chance at life and sees what's underneath those goggles. Nothing, nothing, tra-la-la. Ludwig goes savage and beats the engineer to death with the lid of a, uh, copier? Or maybe a dumpster? I don't know. Either way, he cleans up the body in the end. 
Zed returns to see what's going on, but the medic wrangles himself a weapon, control of Maynard Sentry Gun. Now that ain't a toy, son. Nope, it's an unlockable that he uses to shoot Zed against the wall. Then, as the Conagher's laughing, he double taps him to make sure Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. He takes the mystery briefcase, but doesn't get too far with it. Does this guy got low blood sugar or something? Oh, nope, sorry. He's just sad because he found out the scout is dead. Some blood in his baseball cap are all that remains after Zed's home impalement project. Outside, the spy and soldier arrive, and the soldier vouches for the versatility of his rocket launcher. I'm gonna use it to jump across this ravine. You really have lost your mind, haven't you? What? I've done it before. I love this reference to the in-game practice of rocket jumping, a soldier technique that's hilarious in concept and deadly in execution. Gunfire forces them under the bridge, and we pick back up with them in chapter four. They enter the slaughterhouse through the sewer lines, which is where they get shot at by a sniper. The sniper's presence was hinted at earlier when the medic arrived with a scoped-in POV shot. The soldier baits the sniper into revealing his position. Take your best shot! Thanks to a bulletproof vest, he gets a leg up in the fight. How did you know he wouldn't shoot you in the head? I didn't. They leave the sniper to die, only for the soldier to get stopped by a person from the shadows. Is that the teacher from Charlie Brown? Nope, it's the Pyro, known in Emesis Blue as the Butcher. If their white mask looks familiar, it's because they were seen at the scout's house after his mom's head rolled. I don't think they killed scout's mom though, since they were on the other side of the room from where her head was dropped. My assumption is that they kidnapped scout, took him to the slaughterhouse, and gave him to the Conigers to put inside the coffin. The game Pyro doesn't have a name, nor speak more than muffled noises. A long running rumor is that the Pyro is a lady, with Easter eggs like a purse in the Pyro's locker. The Pyro, as you'd expect, is an up close and burnt toast kind of fighter, but they might be the most compassionate class if we judge by personal perspective. Turns out, they see the world as a baby-filled candy land, and their flamethrower has a trumpet that shoots rainbows. Aw, that's nice. Pyro brings the soldier to his knees, and when the spy steps up, the Pyro shoots him in the leg. Further gunfire causes soldier to sprint away, separating him from his boss when a fire door slams shut. As the Pyro approaches the spy, the sniper laughs at him, seemingly with his last breaths. Pyro becomes a shadow figure and knocks the spy out cold. Spies and pyros are natural enemies in the game, since the pyro's flames are an easy way to suss out spies who are invisible or disguised as teammates. The spy is a support class who can sabotage structures and kill enemies with a single stab to the back. They are annoying as fuck. The character is a besuited French rogue who talks down to the other classes while probably having sex with their moms. For sure the scouts. The spy in Emesis Blue, real name Detective Jacques Murnau, keeps the condescension but loses the suave sophistication. He's more tightly wound and at the end of his rope, mostly because he's stuck with a soldier as an assistant. Now by his lonesome, soldier rudely interrupts a conversation between two shadow men. He hurls a crowbar at them, what the fuck dude, and ducks towards the nearest rift in space time. Huh, has that always been there? Oh yeah, there's also a salad fingers looking motherfucker, but it seems like he's busy right now. Okay, bye! The soldier walks through the portal right into a war that sees nine dead bodies scattered around the trenches. Or maybe this is the war's wreck area? Either way, the Twilight Zone version of his boss catches a whole heap of flames in an attack of some extra crispy foreshadowing. Soldier also sees a scout get shot in the head, and I'll count him as dead, even though maybe he was just bitten by a radioactive bullet. Man, that little guy really doesn't work well with the respawn machine, huh? Soldier wanders back to reality and finds a drinking buddy in the form of a captured demo man from the red team. Soldier names him Cyclops. Maybe Cyclops can explain the plot so far. I want to know what the hell is going on here. I don't know. Damn it. The game's demo man is named Tavish Finnegan de Groot, a chronically drunk demolitions expert from a long line of Scottish demolition experts. He's a defensive class, great for blowing up structures and people. I mean, his default loadout is two different kinds of grenade launchers. Cyclops ain't only missing an eye. He's also missing an arm, but he negotiates his freedom with the soldier only for another shadow person to show up and chuck a crowbar at him for a change. Haha. <laughs> oh wait, actually this isn't a change. It's a time loop and he just hit himself like an idiot. No time for an Amanda show joke though, since the mutated scout is coming around the corner. The soldier takes his new friend to go as old double digits turns everything into creepy ass low fidelity. Wow, I love the distorted look of this attack. It's like we're watching it from a VHS that was copied from another VHS. Soldier ends it by sticking his crowbar into giant scout's forehead in what might be the world's first self-kill assist. Um, okay, you can go now. Cyclops leads the soldier to the promised cache of weapons. They also find damning evidence about the respawn machine. It's more good than you think. 
A lot of these ominous lines about the machine are lifted directly from the Stephen King short story, The Jar. That story's about teleportation, but the central technology can similarly drive a user insane. It's really short and has a disturbing ending, so I highly recommend you read it. The color-crossed friends tiptoe past a bunch of dead-looking bodies, but I ain't counting them yet, because looks like there's still some juice left in the tank. In fact, right after the soldier and demo get their weapons, they learn how much respawning can change a person. It gives them horrible posture. A Resident Evil 1 reference confirms the worst. We've got zombies on our hands! That, or the sniper, is even more perseverant than we thought. I love that gag, and I love the physical comedy of the doorway jam too. Great button with the heavy. Cyclops executes the crawliest creep and proves these zombies still have glass skulls. Turning to the leftover four undead, the heroes take care of them with a Rube Goldberg-like action sequence. The soldier crushes a scout with a supply closet, spilling gasoline all over, as the demo man electrocutes an engineer with an overhead light. That ignites the fumes, which blows the heavy clean in half. They just shoot the last guy, the zombie soldier, but by then, they've earned a lazy kill. Somewhere else in this place, Ludwig comes across a zombie of his own. Like, literally. That's a red medic. A redic? Ludwig shocks his redder half with the broken end of his medigun and flees to an office that looks a lot like his. There, he discovers how that zombie red medic was killed in the first place. Apparently, he acquired Stalingrad's body and used it for experiments. The injection he gives the heavy peps him right up. One might say he's a bit too pepped up. I mean, the guy's so juiced, he thinks he can pull off that hat. The resurrected Russian chases Ludwig through various walls until he's distracted by the badly burned zombie red doctor. He finishes off the guy who brought him back to life with a handheld headshot. Stalingrad continues his top-heavy reign of terror right into the other storyline. He pins down the soldier and demo man beneath a statue of a giant chess piece, maybe? But before he can finish the job, Ludwig reappears and tells the heavy to go screw himself. The three non-zombies make it into an elevator, where they escape the heavy and have a good laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a laugh about it. Not sure how good it is. Boy, they've got a long way to go. What is this, the platform? Chapter 5, The Doorway, starts with a flashback. Back before he was kidnapped, Governor Jules Archibald offered the spy a deal. You wanted a promotion? Here it is. In exchange for a new car that will eventually get blown up, and a new sidekick who he can't fucking stand, the detective executes three political prisoners by shooting them right in the head bag. Aw, these ones don't even have pictures painted on the outside. This is a guilty memory during the detective's torture at the hands of the pyro. Thanks to their efforts, we get to see the spy under his mask. Ooh, ooh, now do the pyro! Oh, never mind. That's... Never mind. The odd triple reached the ground floor, and since Soldier doesn't know the medic, he's suspicious of that briefcase in his hand. That doesn't belong to you. I can explain. Yeah, this movie? Doubt. He tells the medic to sit and stay while he and the demo check the slaughterhouse jail. Wait, slaughterhouse jail? Are these cells for criminal cows? They find Governor Archibald behind bars. Oh, thank God! A rescue! He wastes no time shouting at the soldier for teaming up with the demo. He's bigoted against Cyclops because he's on red team. I mean, he might also be racist, who knows. A creepy wheelchair wheels by creepily, and after that distraction, the soldier finds everyone gone. Everyone except that day of defeat soldier. Man, it's weird seeing a realistic looking human in this space. Cyclops wandered off to a place he thought was a bar, and by the looks of it, it's the one in the Overlook. Covering for Lloyd as bartender is Del Coniger, the engineer from the game and younger brother to the now deceased Maynard and Zed. The demo's regrown eye should be a sign that something's wrong, but if that doesn't do it, you can rely on Del's creepy dialogue about the recent spawn machine. It's eternity in there. Meanwhile, the medic fights another reflection, and in my opinion, wins, then finds the respawn machine itself, which has got some, uh, uh all sorts of fun stuff inside. Looking like Lake Mungo in there. According to the machine, there's been a file corruption, but all you need to do is hit Y for a defrag. The medic complies, and turns out this really is a defrag, since the machine starts building a person and pushing them through the pipes. Alas, another error occurs, and the only thing spawning here is another Kubrick reference, with more blood than any cartoon human body could possibly hold. The soldier wanders into a war room entirely in black and white. This set is straight out of Stanley Kubrick's iconic 1964 satire, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. That film's comic disregard for human life within the military-industrial complex is relevant to this scene, as the soldier listens to Archibald brag about the miraculous respawn machine. We found about ten of them that are respawn compatible. Uh, hold on a moment. Just throw him in the pit with the others. 
We hear the 10th commando shoot himself over the phone, and I'll count it as a kill because we've seen this guy. He's that Day of Defeat soldier from the very beginning who's been haunting the TF2 soldier. We won't be counting any of these bastards of the round table though. I don't care how dressed up you are, you can't escape your skelly nature. Anyway, with the 10th respawner dead, that leaves us with the nine familiar TF2 classes. Governor Archibald conscripted them to Blue Tark Man, then immediately called up his brother to make the same deal. Redmond, Charles Archibald, I have a proposition for you. The soldier starts to get scared by the skellies, but it's a sniper he should be worried about. A zombie sniper? Oh shit, a zombie pirate sniper! Yo ho ho! The soldier escapes into a lab where he shivers his timbers and finds a bunch of frozen test subjects. Might as well call this place Camino, cause they all be looking like him. The only person here who doesn't look like him is the demo man, who the soldier finds frozen on the ground. He had mistaken the faulty laboratory sign for a bar entrance, and for his troubles, he becomes a cyclopsicle, frozen in true Jack Torrance style. The spy is still simmering with the pyro, but during a phone call, he pulls a predator and slips his bonds. The spy shoots his former captive to the ground, then celebrates with a cigarette. He pays for poorly discarding it when things get toasty, and his entire body ignites. It burns him badly before he can put himself out in the nearest raw sewage. The medic's messed up from the horrors he's seen, but he ain't seen nothing yet. A baseball leads him into the scout's mom's house, which now has a warp door at the end of the hall. Through that is another rip in space time. He creates a time loop of sorts when he's revealed to be the reason that box of tapes fell over. Is he also the reason for the scout's mom's death? Maybe, dude's having fucked up delusions about it where he looks straight out of Coraline. This is when the still living pyro finds him, lit up in a blaze of glory. The doctor escapes into the slaughterhouse chapel? What, is this a chapel for hogs? Is there a hog god? What is this place? The medic only has time to put on a crucifix before the pyro appears again and summons a fireball. No, no, he's just on fire. Here doc, have a little fire for your face, ha ha ha. Doc don't like that, so he grabs a ground gun and shoots Pyro in the head, putting an end to Burning Man faster than a bunch of rain and poop floods. Wow, even cuts their head off and everything. Yeah, that'll do the trick. You know, I hope Ludwig's doing okay mentally. <laughs> ah, so probably not. Huh. Somewhere else in this slaughterhouse, Archibald's on the phone saying he's not a war criminal. He's just a guy who's been profiting off of war. The war is their business, and mine is to drag it out for as long as humanly possible. That infernal, unholy contraption is my lifeline. Archibald runs into his former hitman, but the spy is burnt up and growly now. I did your dirty work and hid it from everyone, and look what it did to me! It made him whole face. Archibald can't grovel hard enough to keep the spy from shooting him between the eyes, ending the mission that ruined his self game forever. With the zombie sniper still after him, the soldier hides in what ends up being the training room for new respawnable recruits. Turns out all the subjects were death row inmates who signed over their bodies to be used after execution. The good news is, you're not on death row anymore, since you're technically already dead. Soldier learns that Archibald personally executed his original self. Even more shocking though, is that in this universe, Lyndon B. Johnson is real. Looking like a real guy here. What's he doing presiding over a bunch of cartoons? The one-legged sniper finally catches up to the soldier for revenge, touting a rocket launcher and finally getting to speak some lines. Do you have any idea how long I've waited for this? Longer than you think. In the game, the sniper is named Mundee and was born in New Zealand but raised in the Australian outback. He's a hired killer who takes his job seriously. Oh, and he throws jars of uh, pee at people. Jig Roddy! Sniper sees the pyro pop their head around the corner before it falls to the ground. Since this is the medic wielding an axe, I've gotta go with the popular theory that Ludwig is responsible for killing Scout's mom. He's doing the same trick here, and it explains why Scout was so mad at him when he let him out of his nap coffin. He's probably experiencing psychotic breaks due to the respawn machine, during which he does stuff like murder. And he might even be that Plague Doctor mask guy. I mean, who the fuck knows? The medic's axe swing takes the zombie sniper to the ground. See you on the other side. Soldier double taps him for good measure. Zombie or respawn, he gotta make sure to destroy the head. Just when we think we might get some answers about what Emesis Blue even is, the medic is conked out by the detective. He's in a hurry to get to chapter 6, Catabasis. A Greek word referring to when the hero of a story takes a journey to the underworld. You know, like in Hades Town. The spy sits the medic and soldier down for a friendly game of French roulette. I am the only sane man here. Certainly looks it. The soldier goes first and survives, the detective follows suit, and then it's the medic's turn. No! Things don't go quite as well for old Ludwig. The detective congratulates the soldier on not dying and then disappears into the ether. Soldier has to find his own way out and it leads him straight to what appears to be, well, the pits of hell. Hmm, what do you do in a case like this? I guess cannonball! Oh shit, hold up. This pit is full of still meaty corpses. Dear 
God, is Josh gonna have to count these all by hand? I can't afford all that overtime. Wait a damn second. Rewind! Yes, yes, back to the boardroom part. Let me hear old Archie Warbunker on the phone again. We have about 800,000 corpses on site, and we're not really sure what to do with them. He gave us a number. 800,000 corpses on He gave us a number. 800,000. Well, holy hot damn! According to the Dude Bro Statute of 2022, an amendment of the Final Destination Decree of 2019, in order for mass event kills to count, the disaster must have some amount of visual representation and a serious in-universe number given to account for all the kills. That's what allowed Dude Bro Party Massacre 3 to take the Kill Count Championship with its stupid 4,000 kills and the old Parchtown flood. And that's why I have to add 800,000 to this kill count, holy shit! I mean, I'm just following the rules here. We have mountains of bodies on clear display and a specific number for how many we're supposed to be looking at. It's over. My long personal nightmare is over. The soldier tries to escape a corpse dump truck, but it scoops up his rocket launcher and he gets covered in dead clones of himself trying to get it back. When he finally reacquires his giant boomstick, he finds himself stuck at the most literal depiction of hell yet. This is a reference to Lars von Trier's The House That Jack Built where this broken bridge was, in fact, in hell. Stalingrad shows up in his little shredder hockey mask thing, allowing the soldier to finally test out his rocket jumping skills. Not pretty, but it got the job done. Too bad someone shoots him and he falls back into the pit anyway. He climbs out of a well and learns that his life was just saved by a flask. Good thing his favorite bourbon is bullet. Now, I can't tell if he fell through this portal he sees, but some awful howling... <laughs> encourages him to retreat through these pipes and eventually up through a manhole. He exits right into the beginning of the movie. Wait, what the fuck? Turns out he was the shadow person he saw and almost shot from the car. But this can't be a perfect time loop because this other him is killed when his car blows up. Huh, I can safely say I'm not sure what's happening anymore. The soldier is shaken back to the present tense in the ruins of the crumbling slaughterhouse, where the half-naked heavy returns for one last round. Ooh, rocking a splatterhouse look, I see. Lucky for the soldier, zombie Stalingrad is killed when the building collapses onto him, splattering him for good. Sometime later, the soldier, finally called Mr. Doe here, is debriefed by a company man. He tells him the slaughterhouse is shuttered, and that he should similarly shutter his mouth about everything he saw. You are not to speak for with anyone. The soldier does him one better, and doesn't say anything at all in Chapter 7. Blood Brothers. This denouement takes place at Governor Archibald's funeral, where the soldier is supposed to read from a script that says Dr. Fritz Ludwig killed the governor. The attendees include twin brothers Blue Tark and Redmond Mann, rivals in business, brotherhood, and which one of them has the more disturbingly realistic wrinkles. They spend the whole memorial bickering. What was my friend doing in your compound, Redmond? The detective, now speaking with a voice modulator, since the fire burned his, uh, everything, turns his eulogy into a press conference, blaming the governor's death on the medic and announcing his own promotion. I would be taking his place as chairman of the board. The soldier isn't content to sit with this bullshittery, but before he can pin anything on the spy, Dr. Fritz Ludwig sits up from Archie's casket and turns the new chairman into a floor man. All hell breaks loose and the bodyguards start guarding bodies. The medic pops one in the throat, but doesn't turn the gun against the soldier. Boy, is the soldier glad he was nice to that guy. The medic walks outside where a blue brand truck full of blue brand goons try to get the blue brand jump on him. The soldier sacrifices his funeral party grenade to save the doctor, then tosses him the still mysterious briefcase. Blue Tark Man's hasty getaway ends a couple of blocks away in a nasty car crash that instantly kills his driver. Blue Tark isn't so lucky. He's alive, but a broken man. The soldier finds him in this rough, first shape and shows mercy by putting Blue Tark down. Boy, that sure is a lot of mercy. Probably more mercy than face at this point. Ludwig manages to flag down an ambulance and momentarily gets lost in tender memory of the healer he once was. But then the cops open fire and he goes back to doing as much harm as possible. Just <laughs> the most harm. Redmond Man finds his brother's corpse in his car and stops to pay his final respects. I won! I outlived you, brother! I am the last man standing! He truly was the last man standing for just about two minutes, then he was mostly laying down. Ludwig doesn't let that red speed bump slow him down. He's too busy having memories of Scout like he were Nick Cage at the end of Mandy, just he's a little less smiley than Cage was. The doc keeps driving until the road gets blurry, probably too tired to be behind the wheel, man. Good thing there's a roadside bar to stop at. It's Dell's place, again, and it looks like his dead brothers are blurrily in the background. The medic retreats into the restroom, which is just like the bathroom of The Shining. Wow, Chad Payne really loves that movie, huh? The doctor takes a chill pill, but discovers it isn't Valium. It's actually... Mm. 
Title Drug! The medic's been taking and prescribing Emesis Blue this whole time, a drug meant to suppress the side effects of the respawn machine. That means the medic is dead. Looks like he fell asleep driving and crashed his ambulance into a phone pole. If the noxious red glow of the briefcase is anything to go by though, I think the medic will be back in no time. Well, I shouldn't say no time. It's eternity in there. Whew! Counting the kills in this thing takes longer than you think. But I'm done now, so let's get to the numbers. Oh my god! It was eternity in there! I was able to get so much done! Is there any way to get back? Please? Does anything else want to fall on me? I never thought I'd see the day, but I counted 800,054 kills in Emesis Blue. And you know what that means. Zoran, get in here! Everybody, your winner and new Kill Count World Champion, Emesis Blue! <laughs> How is that any less obscure than Dude Bro? Get out of here! <laughs> anyway, every kill in this thing was a dude, except for Scout's mom, so a pie chart is pretty much useless. But may I offer you a bar graph with how many times each class died? This excludes the big groups, obviously, but looks like the medic and the scout tied for most deaths at five. And congrats to the demo and the pyro for only dying once each. Finally, with a runtime of 108 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 0. .00013 minutes, or 0. .008 seconds. I'll give the golden chainsaw the coolest kill to all those zombie red team kills in that action sequence. Very creative and fun to watch. I appreciate how long this must have taken to animate. Good stuff. Double shade for lamest kill will go to Jeremy the Scout. Not saying I wanted to see him get the driller killer treatment on screen, but he's an important character who dies off screen with only a hat left behind. That's not even a fun hat. And that's it. Emesis Blue was uploaded in February and has already amassed over 6 million views and almost as many fan theories. Until my next research, Spawn. I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Hey everyone, thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count for Emesis Blue. Definitely something different for the Kill Count. That propos for the weird era. I only realized after I filmed that, you know, Scout has his fucking sleeves rolled up and I should have been doing this the whole time, man. Come on, fucking. Let's go. Also, 800,000 kills is, um, I don't know, that's pretty fucked up. <laughs> Clearly, that kind of fucks with the whole system. So, you know, we'll uh, figure out something to do with this. I have a few ideas of where we can go from here. Because I don't want the competition to, you know, just be closed from now on. Seriously, though, huge congratulations to Chad Payne and everyone else involved in making Emesis Blue. I've watched it so many times now to write the script and try to figure out what the fuck is going on. And honestly, I never get bored of it. I am always fascinated and impressed by what I'm watching. Seriously, great work, Chad. Happy Halloween, everybody. Be good people. Play ball!